uh, I would like to ask you guys to start the session today by asking, uh, what was it about yesterday that was magical? What do you remember from yesterday that's still barking at you when you were trying to sleep last night? What was it that was still ringing in your ears at the time from yesterday's session? <laughs> Mr. Mokhtar, can we start with you, please? Okay. Well, I think the things that struck me from yesterday were humanity, humility, uh, the courage to be yourself, uh, and the ability to do good. You know, whether you stand um, on the shoulders of a great man or whether you stand at the surface, the ability to change. That's it. Well, That's it. All right. Uh, I, was, uh, I was here at the opening. Uh, the yes. Elevator. Uh, I, I had to leave, uh, so I missed Francois and uh, Francis Jacques' session, which I regretted, but uh, I hope to be able to get a video of that. But I was here uh, when Nikon uh, yes. uh, gave his speech and uh, gave his talk and uh, uh, the wars. Uh, what I, my, my key takeaways, um, I think the, the idea or the body of knowledge about leadership that we know today and going forward is taking a drastic turn, is changing uh, from what we know it for. And I think Rajiv alluded uh, to it a little bit when you talk about you know, looking at talents and how we look at uh, the, the, the first phase, the second phase, the phase now is the fourth phase, uh, where before we take a look at IQ, take a look at you know, uh, the past uh, performance and past achievements, uh, now we realize that uh, that might not work that well. Uh, now, people are, if you had the opportunity to read uh, an article in the Harvard Business Review in September last year, there, there's an article that talks about uh, uh, talent spotting the 21st century. They talk about uh, potential instead of, looking, uh, instead of just looking at, at competencies. And of course, uh, the idea about leadership itself, talking about you know, only the, the strong survive and survival of the fittest and all that. Uh, the body of knowledge that we have for the past 10,000 years where you know, we need to get the strongest, the fastest, the, 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 the tallest, uh, the most handsome guy or the most beautiful uh, Cleopatra. Uh, now that's changing, changing already. Right. Uh, about, it's about uh, having humility uh, uh, to deal with, uh, with the people and getting uh, people, getting a group of people to work together towards the same uh, common cause, so to speak, right? uh, to get them excited, motivated, uh, and to learn and uh, to develop themselves together, uh, moving towards the same direction. And I think that's the, the, the dynamic of where we're going. Uh, and of course, we talk about uh, humility and gift giving. Uh, they could talk about that, and that's a completely change of mindset from what we already have. And uh, it's a bit, it's not very comforting, but because we're so used to something, and changing change is not an easy thing. And uh, but it's also uh, an opportunity as well uh, to change the world for the better, uh, and we have that opportunity to do it right now from here, from here on out. Thank you, Rajiv. Rajiv, how about you? You know, it's very difficult for me to uh, pick. Uh, one or two moments from yesterday. Yesterday was magical overall for me. And uh, if there was one thing I would pick that uh, really came home for me yesterday was this. Once you get clear about your calling, once you get clear about how you're going to make a small difference in the world, right. then the whole definition of what success is changes. The fact that Nipun lives in a Buddhist monastery in California. In California. And uh, he and his wife uh, decided not to have children, so they don't let the eye enter their minds, our bodies, at all. They don't, he doesn't need money. And she doesn't need money. And success is defined in hugs and smiles rather than in terms of you know, the size of my car and my office. Wow. And then a, a very successful uh, surgeon who has delivered 14,000. She was by far my favorite yesterday. Uh, 14,000 babies, was it? Uh, four, was zero. it four zero? Four zero? 14,000. Oh, there she is. 14, there she is. Uh, it was looking for you. And then decides to completely change her life to do what she's doing now. Wow. Wow. And what's the definition of success anymore? So that's what it was for me. Were there any parts of yesterday's session that made sense to you, Rajiv? I'm going to start with you. But you went, no, that's a bit of a, of a stretch for me. Uh, let me think on that one for a little bit. Was there any parts of yesterday that was like that for you, personally? Well, 
I asked, uh, I don't know uh, if, if there was such a moment, but uh, when I interviewed Waz uh, for our leader's room later, I asked him, you know, were there any times when, uh, when you felt like giving up, when it was the struggle years of Apple and when it was really tough and you thought that, ah, it's, you know, it's not going to work? And he said, never. He said, we had made so much money with the first couple of computers that we had so many billions in the bank account that we were allowed to make mistakes for 10 years. Uh, and I said, wow, now that would be a fun place to be. You have $10 billion <laughs> in your bank account, and you can then go 10 years and make mistakes after mistakes, whether it was the first Mac or whether it was the Lisa right. uh, computer that didn't work. Now that would be a nice place to, to be, and that kind of almost sounded unrealistic to me. <laughs> okay. Dr. Farid, um, the little time that you had with us yesterday, but you could take your thoughts back to the evening session we had dinner yesterday also. Were there any parts that you were, okay, that's, that sounds good to me, but I'm going to put that on, on, on the, uh, the back shelf for a little bit for now. I'm going to come back to it later. Were there any parts of yesterday that was uh, like that for you? I, I was privileged to have, uh, to, have a, to, to have, to be given the opportunity to spend some time with, uh, with the speakers last night at, yeah. at dinner. And, and um, thanks to these guys, um, you know, uh, Nipun also gave a, uh, a little talk and Tansi Dimala as well. And, um, you know, uh, the whole idea, the whole concept of gift giving, I think, um, that is completely antithesis to what we know uh, human interest would like to do. That's right. And uh, that's a completely uh, change of mindset. Um, you know, I'm not sure whether, I don't know whether it's sustainable. Uh, you know, we all like to be selfless. We all like to do things for the, for the greater good. Uh, we all like to see people do, do, do good things to one another, but yet, yet sometimes um, uh, we see the opposite uh, happening uh, uh, around, around us. And also at the same time, uh, to, be, uh, to be able to sustain that mindset and uh, that, that behavior over a long period of time, uh, seeing what's happening around you is a challenge. The perseverance, right? Yeah. Uh, the perseverance uh, part of it. Uh, but, uh, but perhaps, uh, you know, uh, with, with the right amount of momentum and help uh, around us, maybe we can make it a reality, I think. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have the answer. So, Mukta. I think my reflection would be, I mean, yesterday was just a series of very uh, inspirational moments where, you know, as you witness through the eyes of those who've lived a life, you know, what the challenges are. And how they use those challenges effectively to shape and refine and define their own thinking. Uh, they found courage within their convictions. They found the power to do good in very yeah. difficult circumstances. But above all, you know, life is about giving, not just receiving. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a sentiment that you know, rings true. And I think for most of us who live a life where you know, we're, we're busy on the corporate treadmill, the opportunities to give um, and give back beyond the corporate life that you live, to, so to give to a community, to give to a good cause, to give time and give yourself, that was a very powerful takeaway. And I think that's you know, how you find fulfillment. And I think that's the other side of the equation, which is what is leadership all about? You know, is leadership about achieving a defined set of aims or objectives? Or is, is it really about helping people live their dreams? Is it help about a group of people doing good, more than just the corporate good. In, in your, I'm going to um, push back a little bit and, and force you guys to be a bit more personal with us today, um, as, I gave, as I warned you in the room, back room just now. Uh, can you be a bit more personal and share with us, in your personal progression to where you are right now, what are some of the learnings that you've discovered about I think the most difficult person to lead ever, ever, is oneself. So how did you manage to do that? Rather nicely, I would say. And, uh, and what are some of the learnings that you could share with us in this room today? Who wants to go first? I'll kick, I'll kick off then. <laughs> they were having uh, this in the back room just now all the time. So look at. <laughs> the two captains, let okay. them decide. Well, I think, um, look, I mean, I think Everybody has a very particular and unique experience to share with regard to their own journey. And I'm sure all of us will recognize the many um, challenges that we faced. I suppose mine, 
and the one that has held throughout my own life was growing up as an immigrant child um, in the UK, because I moved to the UK when I was seven. And uh, the UK is a magnificent country, but at that particular time, it probably wasn't uh, the most open society and the most caring society that was around. And I think as an immigrant child, you have so many challenges, the challenges of language, the challenges of culture, just the ability to be assimilated. And I think those were very formative experiences because you learn the hard way. Uh, you learn about rejection. You learn about not being part of the in crowd. Uh, you, you, you have to find a means of acceptance. Uh, and for me, that acceptance came in actually the strangest of ways. It actually came firstly through sport. Because actually on a sporting field... Don't tell me you play rugby. Also. Oh, surprisingly. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, in a rugby field, it's very interesting. Whether you're big or you're small, you know, you will face your fears. Because the big man is afraid of being outrun by the small man. And the small man is afraid of being crushed by the big man. <laughs> okay? But neither the big man or the small man can stand still. Okay? They learn to move. You learn to win together as a team. You learn to lose together as a team. You learn to shout instructions to each other and to follow. And actually, at the end of the day, you're the collective outcome of your collective efforts. And those were powerful lessons. I think the other thing that taught me was communication. That actually, never mind having the greatest ideals and aspirations in your life, but whether you could communicate or not was critical. Because you were only as good as or as bad as the weakest or the slowest member of your team. And, you know, look out for you know, that link, because that's the link that you all need to support. And I think those lessons in my life kind of taught me the importance of being very clear about what you want to do, um, you know, and be very passionate. Because I don't think you can ever fulfill your dreams if you're not passionate. And I don't think you can lead people if you don't really believe yourself that what you're asking other people to do, you've either done yourself or can do yourself. Um, and conviction really comes from a personal belief that you're heading in the right direction and for the right reasons. And so those, those years for me were tough years, uh, years in which there was a lot of pain. Um, but actually, I think now I look back and I think, wow, I'm so glad that that came. And I'm so glad that it came so early in life because the earlier you learn those lessons in life, the quicker you as a human being adapt. Um, and I think it taught me the fact that you can never stand still you know, that life is actually, by definition, largely unequal. It's you who will make it equal. But you've got to have that determination and that passion to succeed. I think the only other thing I would observe to you is so many great things in life come from having great people around you in life. Uh, and that my father, probably, in my own world. That would be my know, next question. Who are some of those people who helped you along, sir? Well, I think my father, you know, was just one of these uh, immensely patient people you know, who in a few words uh, could touch the lives of many people um, and gave me uh, an endless enthusiasm to believe in the art of the possible. You know, that you will achieve what you believe you can achieve, not what other people tell you you can achieve. So go and fight for your dream and go and achieve what you can yeah. and show what you can do. And I think, you know, Whatever I've done in life, I mean, I've always kind of thought, you know, actually a lot of it is down to the wisdom that your parents can bestow upon you. And if you're fortunate enough to come from a good home, you're fortunate enough to have good parents, you're fortunate to have a magnificent partner as a wife and as children, you're, you're very lucky. You've got foundations that allow you to grow. And it's those people that I think have shaped my dimensions. Even in the quietest of moments, I'm sure even you felt terribly challenged, especially when trying to overcome a huge um, um, obstacle, um, either when you were a child mm. or especially now when you're a banker. What are some of the things that you do or who are some of the people that you still go to to talk to, to get? Because this is the energy for energy from mm. to continue this pursuit. I think energy comes in many sources from, men, from many people. I don't think there's just one source of energy. I think that uh, in jobs like mine, actually, the greatest exhilaration uh, is actually to get out of your office and go and speak to people, you know, who are in the front line. So I love, you know, going to my branches. I love talking to my people 
who are actually doing the jobs. Because, of course, when I talk to my management, everything is fantastic, naturally. <laughs> you know, of course, that is as it should be. And when I talk to my boss, I'm sure I represent exactly the same thing. That's right. But actually, <laughs> it's talking to your people that gives you the energy and the motivation to really realize what's going on. That's right. Uh, and I think, you know, you've got to find ways of, uh, as I call it, earthing yourself. Go and find a reality. I think the other thing out of yesterday that particularly resonated was uh, go and find a good cause. Go and find something where you are away from your corporate wardrobe. So, you know, go and volunteer. Go and spend some time and live the real world that people live. Because I do think, and in, in my case certainly, I think we, we live a charmed existence. You know, you're in many ways in a, in a privileged part of society. Uh, how many times do you really touch the real world? People who don't have what you have and people who have real issues and needs. And so I find my energy really not so much from the textbook or not so much, with all due respect, from conferences or panels but it's much more about getting in touch with the real people in the world um, and finding you know, things that are important. So, so I, my, my father called me one day, out of the blue, as he normally does, and he said, uh, Mukhtar, I need some money. I said, Dad, of course. Uh, what do you want money for? He said, well, trees. Trees? Really? Trees. He said, well, we, what you don't realize is I'm about to plant some trees in areas where there are no trees. Okay. So about a year later, I went to see his tree project. And he'd taken a road where there are no trees and planted trees all the way along. And he said, I want you to understand that on this roadway, there are people who need places to sit in the shade, birds who need branches to sing. And those songs are songs of prayers for the good of all people who are traveling on this road. I thought, now that's interesting. Now when he rings, I never ask him. Yeah. And so people do good in their own ways. People, you know, spend money, spend time. And I think if you're going to get energy, you've got to find sources of energy that are not just in your own domain. You've got to find sources of energy and passion. And going back to yesterday, that was why it was just terrific listening uh, to the speakers yesterday, because the inspiration that they provide, that's the energy. That's the energy that I think can help, you know, corporate leaders shape a future for themselves. I'm going to change your, the meaning of your designation. CEO to me is Chief Energy Officer. That's what you are. And I can see the fruit has not fallen very far from the tree. Yeah. 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 Is your father still around? Oh, yes. Very much so. Right. I will warm regards to him then. <laughs> yes. Um, Dr. Farid, your turn, Dr. I was happy listening to him. I'm, I'm sure you are. <laughs> He pulls that trick on us all the time, <laughs> but he's got loads of stories to share. This is not my first experience with, with Dato. He's, he's an impeccable speaker, so I'm going to see some of that coming through right now. Be a bit more personal with us today, sir. Yeah, first of all, I've got to apologize because you know, I'm not old enough, neither am I successful enough to share my experience to inspire people. Um, uh, my personal experience is, uh, is pretty mundane in a way. I grew up in a poor family. I learned to swim in the river, uh, you know, fly uh, kites in the, in, in the paddy fields and all that kind of stuff. And I uh, was fortunate enough to have uh, a parent that focused on education for the children, and I managed to do relatively well in school. Um, so, you know, I, I had brothers who, who did well in school as well, and, um, you know, and uh, you know, I, I, I played sports, I represented school in sports, and. Uh, I still live in a world where, you know, for the past 10,000 years, the, the tallest guy, the, you know, uh, would be leaders or, you know, the loudest. I wasn't the loudest, by the way. Um, so, you know, I, I started working in, in, a, in an investment bank and, you know, I like doing it because, you know, uh, the, the, the financial engineering part of it, you know, creating value almost out of nothing, and that appealed to me for a few years and uh, until, okay, no disrespect to investment bankers in this room, but after a while I thought, I'm not creating anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to do something more, Oops. and uh, again, through the path of life, I met people, get involved in projects, and uh, I, was, I was on the board of a few companies. I was on the board of UEM and uh, Bank Lipo and, and, and uh, Excel Comindo in Indonesia, and I found that those kind of, those kind of experiences are more, more interesting. The, the, the opportunity 
to create an environment where people, ordinary people, can become extraordinary. That is that's something that appeals to me. Uh, not for myself, but to see that happens and to yeah, create sure. that kind of environment. Of course. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, I thought it's more satisfying than you know doing investment making deals. So um, I. I did a little bit of that. I experienced some of that uh, uh, in some, some of my previous uh, uh, occupation, and therefore, I, I kept looking for that again. And uh, you know, I, I think to my, uh, it's fortunate for me that I found that in Maybank, uh, a group of 47,000 Maybankers who are very, very passionate about the bank and about the community that they are in. Uh, my personal experience, my personal challenge, and uh, I. I, because I didn't have the, the, the kind of challenges that people talk about, and I always look for inspiration with, uh, on other people's life and see uh, what they have done. You know, uh, yesterday we talked, we, we heard about Mandela, we heard about Gandhi, and obviously we can we, we can find those life experiences in you know uh, the the, well the public, and I do a lot of that, searching for the, that experience and sharing with my, my colleague. You know, Shackleton is one one of them. Uh, you know, uh, the, the the perseverance of one person to bring you know, uh, all these colleagues to safety when they were in, uh, in South Pole. And that is something that, you know, uh, a very inspiring story to, to share with people, to, to, to that, you know, to create uh, the ability to persevere in a very difficult environment. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very inspiring. But at the same time, my personal challenge has always been, you know, I'm an, I'm, this is a small scale, by the way. Uh, Rajiv talked about, you know, uh, Using psychometrics and my breaks, I am an ISTJ. I'm a huge, huge introvert. So being up here is not very comfortable for me. Uh, you know, speaking in front of public is not very comfortable. Uh, you know, I had to do a lot of things to adjust myself to become comfortable. People think I'm an extrovert. Far from it. I prefer to stay in the room and read a book. <laughs> um, you know, uh, but you know, I, I know the requirement of it. Uh, being a CEO in this, in this case of Maybank, I enjoy engaging my colleagues, and, and therefore I, I know the task that I'm up to, which is to inspire people. And I try to do as much as, we, as I can, uh, picking my life experience, the story of my life experience, picking the story that I've seen that has, put, that has been happening around me. But most of all, it's the mission. Uh, you know, I, in Maybank, a few years ago, uh, five years ago to be exact, we decided that we want to humanize financial services. Uh, and by the way, this is not from me, this is not from Wahid, this is not from any of the uh, leaders. It came from the 47,000 Mi bankers. They want to change the mission of the bank because we saw that the things that are not right in the world uh, involving banks. Uh, banks uh, are, are not uh, trusted, and uh, especially in the western part of the world. And banks have become so transactional. Uh, yeah. We see you as dollars and cents we, instead of seeing you as a human being. Uh, you know, we, we see you as an opportunity to make money from instead of saying, let me share uh, your, your, your burden and figure, out, figure, figure this out together. Um, so these are the things that, uh, that motivates May Bankers and we quickly, excellent, let's pick it up and, and, and run with it. So humanizing financial services, therefore, is our mission. And, and you know, we, we try to put in the balance scorecard, how do we... How do we how do we quantify this, this mission statement that, that, that fire up the belly of 47,000 May bankers around the world while making money, right? So, you know, uh, that's the energy that's been, uh, that's been helping me. Uh, and of course, the energy of the 47,000 May bankers that, that, that I have uh, together with me. And of course, my colleagues, are very, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have colleagues, Nora, uh, Moni, these guys will, you know, will we'll, we'll check each other. Uh, uh, Make sure that we have that check and balance to see that you know we are, we are staying on the right path when it comes to mission, uh, what we're doing uh, at the bank. So I'm very fortunate, to be honest with you. Okay. Rajiv, you too. Your turn, please. Well, what can I say? Um, uh, after all that has been said, other than the fact that you know, um, I've realized that. Uh, Finding your calling is not something that happens out of the blue. One day you get a revelation from God that this is what you were sent to the world for. Life's a journey. And over time, if you pay attention to day-to-day -day experiences, everybody has experiences. Every day, every second, every minute that we live on this earth, we are having some experience. Right now, we are experiencing the company of uh, the people in this room. Uh, so everybody gets experiences. 
fewer people do the second part, which is reflection based on that experience. What was my experience like today, and what is my, my inner voice telling me about what that meant? And if we live life that way, which is experience plus reflection, eventually you land on your calling in life. And when you land, you really land. And then it's a lot of fun. It's not work anymore. Then it's just fun, fun, fun. So my life is now just fun, fun, fun. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> wow. I was thinking about the Beatles, and you mentioned fun, fun, fun. It's the Beach Boys all over again, um, the 60s. Anyway, uh, Mr. Mokta, how do you, um, at the um, er, um, young age that you, are, that you are at now, and the level that you have achieved so far, how do you learn? What do you, what do, you do to, to, I mean, you run a fantastic organization. Where do you go to, 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 aside from going to conferences held by ECLIF, <laughs> what do you do to improve your learnings? I, th I think for me, I mean, learning, you know, is an everyday experience. You learn everything, you know. I mean, there is a certain anatomical fact. You know, God give, did give us two ears and one mouth. Perhaps he was also trying to give us a proportion of listening to talking, you know. Um, and if you listen, you learn a great deal from many people. And I don't think, you know, I think from, from my own personal journey, I think listen very, very hard to, you know, what people are saying uh, or what they're trying to say. Um, I have to say it's challenging in societies which are hierarchical by nature, so people sometimes feel constrained in what they can say to somebody senior, but yeah. you know what they're trying to convey, and it's important yeah. to be able to relate to that. Uh, I think learning comes sometimes, uh, and I'm very fortunate, uh, you know, that I have, however, 32 years had the privilege of working in one institution, yeah. Yeah. Uh, probably because I was too useless to work anywhere else. Um, but in that one institution, you know, we are a global institution, and there are so many people to reach out to. Because the th one thing I've come to realize is that actually v there are very few experiences in life that are truly unique, that actually many business issues yeah have either been faced by colleagues you know, elsewhere. And the most important thing to do is to reach out to them. Um, I would observe, I mean, leadership's a really lonely business right at the top. You know, and ultimately, the hard part of leadership is not soliciting feedback, but actually making a tough decision when it's a finely balanced range of facts, both for and against. So learning comes, I think, for me, from listening and talking to people. Um, taking time to reflect on what they're saying uh, or why they're saying it. Yes. Um, challenging and testing, and I think most of my senior colleagues would attest to the fact that I challenge them a great deal, just to test the assumptions upon which our, built, you know, our thinking is built. Because uh, certainly in large multinational corporations, there can always be a very easy assumption that actually what prevails in one part of the world also prevails in another. And actually, you know, local differences can be very substantially different. I think if you listen and you learn to your colleagues and you listen and you learn to people from the community, yeah. uh, you learn a great deal, um, both outside in. And I think it's really important that that's you know, a lens that you apply to yourself. Is it's not what you think looking out. It's much more important what people think looking in. Uh, and just to pick up on what Dr. Fried has just said, you know, I think the industry that we work in uh, has been challenged, and quite rightly so. You know, I think we have uh, an enormous sense of social responsibility in addition to a financial responsibility. And I think we've got to be able to demonstrate that through connecting with people far more. And that comes through listening. Uh, and so a lot, of, you know, a lot of what I'm doing you know, is listening and assimilating and then trying to sort of reach out to people who've had similar experiences. Yeah. Um, and I'm fortunate. I think you know, uh, HSBC as an organization has had a privileged history. And we've been around for a long time. 150 years next year. So in that time, uh, we've been through many a difficult experience. Uh, and what you learn in life is it's not how you survive your successes, but it's how you deal with your challenges. You know, and those challenges have come somewhere at some time before. Just have the wisdom to reach out you know, and, and, and find out what the solutions were then. That took right? Uh, well, for me, um, I know you read voraciously. You read a lot of books. Aside from that, what do you do? When I have the time. <laughs> <laughs> the toilet. 
Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I made it very clear with my colleagues, and this is what I do typically when, when I go to a place and I tell them, look, this is the kind of person that I am. I have a lot of blind spots. Uh, I'm not a superman. I need you to protect my blind spots. So, you know, uh, I don't believe in uh, personality leadership. Um, I think that is, uh, uh, that, that is a PR con, in my, my, my own opinion. I think uh, leadership is, uh, is carried out by a group of people. In fact, not just a small group of people, a big uh, a part of the organization. Right. Everybody plays a role in providing leadership for the organization. So knowing that I have flaws, um, I, have, I have blind spots, I ask my colleagues, these are my blind spots, please protect me from these blind spots. Tell me when this is happening. My biggest worry is hubris, you know. Um, you know hubris, technical term of it is believing in your own bullshit. So, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always afraid of that because I have ego, everybody has ego, and sometimes that takes a better of me and I'm trying not to make sure that I'll, be, uh, I'll keep that in check. Uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the key challenge is uh, we all work together in trying to make sure that uh, we prepare people to take over from, from us uh, when the time comes. So we spend a lot of time looking at, let's, let's identify these individuals that will look, take over from us, uh, uh, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, we do not want to be too comfortable in our seats right now. Um, and therefore, you know, for the sake of the organization, for the sake of the great, greater good organi organization, the right guy who comes next should take over from us when the time comes. So we, we do spend a bit of time doing that within the organization. Okay. Rajiv? Well, learning. I agree with everything that uh, the two of them have said, and uh, particularly to pick up on what Dr. Farid said. I'm also learning from both of them right now. Um, and particularly uh, Dato, who I've gotten to know a little bit since yesterday, having spent some time with him, is that a big part of learning is the humility that these two gentlemen bring. If you're humble, uh, learning will happen. Uh, so I agree with everything they've said, but I'd like to add one more uh, source of learning which has worked for me yes. uh, that I'd like to share, and that is to change your orientation from if only to what if. So, you know, there's so much to complain about around the world. This is not right. This, if only this was like this, or if only this would change to that. If only, if only, if only. Yeah. But if we ask instead, what if we could do this? What if we could try that? And you're willing to take some risk to try the what ifs? A uh, tremendous amount of learning happens. Of course, you get egg on your face every now and then. Uh, but the tremendous amount of learning that happens when you, when you ask the what if question and are willing to take a little bit of risk. Uh, and the biggest learning comes from failure. So, thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, um, Mr. Mokta, I'm going to skip Dr. Farid for this question. <laughs> I knew he'd be very grateful for me because of that. Um, well, he was the one who whispered in my ear, let's ask this question something to Rajiv and to uh, Mokta, but not to himself. So how, he's, I'm how learning he's I a very smart this? man besides being humble as well. He's been working on Sabri since yesterday. Ask these two guys more questions. <laughs> he and he even planted the, some questions. He's the group CEO and also the chief PR officer. That, that, that's for it. Okay, um, the question is this. Um, uh, you know, uh, we do some, we think we're doing a lot of work in, in developing leadership in, in corporate Malaysia. Because you come from the UK, sir. Tell us. How far are we, uh, how good are we doing it? On a scale of one to 10, where, where are we? 10 being excellent and one is the opposite of that. Please let me know, I need to know that. Well, let me answer that question by starting somewhere before we get to the answer to that question. It's gonna be very long. So here's a, <laughs> here's a state secret for you Malaysians. Uh, P.S., you live in one of the most beautiful countries in the world. You simply don't know how good you've got it. Okay? So, you know, for those of us who've had the great privilege of coming to Malaysia, and let me tell you, uh, in HSBC, when you were appointed the CEO of Malaysia, you've just ascended to corporate heaven. <laughs> okay? Because you must have done something right to have been considered to be put in that position. In my case, I'm still trying to discover what it was. Okay? <laughs> but having arrived in this country, what do you see? You see a wonderful, 
multi-ethnic, multicultural country that is you know, potentially slightly at unease with itself domestically, but internationally everybody loves you. And actually when Malaysians travel overseas, they become true Malaysians. Okay? So actually you've got something absolutely humongously good to start with. You don't suffer from civil wars, conflicts, uh, a difficult neighborhood, you know, uh, protracted positions, all of those things you're spared of. Secondly, you've got some terrific institutions. Okay? And I do think that, you know, we should pay tribute to how Malaysia has developed its institutions and in the sector that I work in. Uh, and I don't say that lightly. You know, 32 years of the banking industry, probably Bank Negara is the best regulator that I've dealt with as a professional. Okay? Uh, anywhere across the world. And why is that? Because I think as a regulator, they understood the challenges that the financial crisis, the first financial crisis of 97, 98 brought, and took a series of very important actions to rem remedy and remediate what occurred. And I think in that, that whole process of pain, some real leadership was developed. And that leadership you know, sits today uh, in the case of you know, the governor. She's one of the very best governors worldwide. Yes, she is. The very institution that we're sitting in, uh, it tells you about the focus on development. Uh, I look at my own institution, and I'm absolutely thrilled by the quality of the people that I see because they are absolutely world class in terms of their potential. Now, you know, I hope that they will go on to realize that potential and experience an opportunity will give them that chance. And in the audience today, you have some of my more senior colleagues and you also have some executive trainees. And every single one of you, okay, has the opportunity to be the CEO of HSBC, not the CEO of HSBC Malaysia. Okay, you have to believe that. Sometimes I think that Malaysians don't believe in themselves as much as they can and they should. Okay? Give yourself the chance to believe. Because yesterday, in Tansri Jamila, you saw what can happen when a Malaysian you know, leads the charge. Okay? So the message I have is actually, I think leadership is in pretty good state here. I think you've got awareness, you've got revenue, you know, recognition, You've got a pipeline of talent. Um, it's time for Malaysia to find more leaders because it has the opportunity to take a bigger leadership position in the world than it currently has. Is there one particular area where we could still do a lot of work in to improve ourselves? In? Yeah. I think, you know, from my own institutional point of view, the only thing I, I could wish for was that people would speak up. I think we live in a highly deferential society. You know, people are still afraid to voice an opinion, you know, on the basis that it may offend somebody or that it may not be polite to be public. I think what the West probably teaches you is it's okay to have a different opinion as long as you're constructive uh, and as long as it's expressed in the right way. It's fine to be, you know, fine sometimes to be different. You know, there's not a, there, there's, there, there shouldn't be a shyness uh, and that's the thing that I probably struggle with most in our organization, which is genuinely we try very hard at communicating with our people. But can we get the, what they really think, you know, in the forums uh, rather than feedback around the coffee machine? Uh, and that's the challenge that we've got, and we're working on it. Thank you. Very good. Rajiv, your turn. I know you think of yourself as a Malaysian half of the time now, <laughs> but I'm going to ask you to go back to the other half, which is still uh, American uh, from India, and give us your answer, please. Um, you know, I find that there is a huge hunger in Malaysians in general for learning uh, and for leadership. Uh, the fact that there are so many people here today and yesterday, the fact that, you know, um, we meet such wonderful people, you and I, Sabri, in our yes. classes every week, um, and the curiosity and the hunger to learn is just amazing. And they are sometimes like sponges uh, that, you know, that soak in, very, very reflective. Um, so I think there's a lot going on. I agree everything, with everything that Mukhtar said. It's a beautiful country. Yeah. Um, if there's one issue that I, I, I wish you would do less of as Malaysians is stop looking at all the negatives in your country. You talk about the negatives more than you talk about the positives. As Mukhtar said, this is a beautiful country. 
you've got so much going for you. Uh, but uh, you know, criticizing what the one or two things that are not right seems like a national pastime. Let's stop that. <laughs> yeah. Aside uh, yeah. from eating, of course. <laughs> All right, thank you. Dr. Farid, is that, that okay for you now? Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, See, he really tried to get us into trouble, right, <laughs> Mukhtar? <Yeah. laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause and my gratitude to you. Thank you. Thank you very much.